Genesis chapter 18, and Jeremiah chapter 32. Let's remember to pray for all those that are off preaching uh, in different places in the world this morning. Uh, I don't know if any of our preachers have gone off or not. Uh, I know there will be some tonight, but let's be praying for them. Roy Lee, is it, right? Okay, pray for Brother Roy as he's preaching this morning and the ones that will be preaching tonight. And then pray for those other churches right here in the, in the county and their preachers as they're preaching this morning. I always remember to pray for them that God will bless them and, and use them and help them. Genesis chapter 18. And we're reading here in the story of God's dealings with Abraham. And you know the great story there in the book of Genesis as God dealt with his man. The great faith that Abraham ex exercised in God. And the Lord told him that he's going to have a kid and, and it was hard for him and his wife to believe because he's 99 and she's 90. It was way up in years. And the Lord told him there in verse 10, And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. That means she couldn't have no kids. She knew she was physically unable to have a kid. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Now you'll notice there in verse number 14, a great question. I'm going to present to you a great question from the Word of God and the Bible answer. The great question in verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord. The answer is in Jeremiah 32. You got it there? Jeremiah 32 and verse 17. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Am I too loud? Hey! Can you hear me? The reason I've done that is because I can't hear. I've got the flu or something and I can't hear myself. But I, if I get too loud, just do like this or something and I'll tell him to turn me down. I want to preach to you this morning on is anything too hard for the Lord? Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity we have. Bow in your presence and call you our Father. Oh, God, as we bow before thee this morning... We confess all of our sin. We thank you, Lord, this morning that we're saved by the grace of God. We thank you, Lord, that we're on our way to glory. We thank you this morning for the blood that was shed on Calvary, that we could have eternal life. Our Father, this morning we pray that you would anoint these lips of clay, that we may say just exactly what you want said. Save lost souls, change lives. Help us, O oh God, to do thy will. And whatever and however you do for us, we'll praise you and thank you for it. Move on this congregation. Dear God, we need your help this morning. Without you, we're nothing. But with you, we can do all things that we're commanded to do and ought to do and want to do and should do. Now, Lord, have your way in this service. God, move on every heart, and we'll praise you and thank you for it all. In Jesus' blessed name we pray, and for Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Is anything too hard for the Lord? With our weak faith and in this world of reasoning and figuring out, we present from the Bible this great question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then we give you the Bible answer from Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, thou art great 
and there is nothing too hard for thee. What a comforting thought that is in this day of turmoil that you and I are living in. Why, you know that if you're, if you're, if a lot of times we take it for granted, but we forget a lot of times just how messed up the world is and how young people and older alike are out there seeking for something to answer to their problems. And there are people out there that's got problems, brother. Don't kid yourself. I mean, they've got problems so big that they think there's nobody knows about my problems. And there's people in here this morning, teenagers and young men and women, that have got a lot of problems in your life. And did you know this morning, I'm glad to tell you there's nothing too hard for God. What a privilege it is that I've got to be able to stand up here and tell you there's nothing too hard for God. You came to the right place this morning. If you went down here to a, a counselor session or a, or a psychiatrist, they might tell you that there's no hope and that there's no way out of your problems. They probably wouldn't, but uh, a lot of times they might. But did you know this morning? Uh, did you know this morning that there's nothing too hard for our God? This is an all-important question. I mean, if this question, if this question is right and this answer is valid, then we've really got something worth meeting about three and four times a week and seven, excuse me, seven times a week. But if this, uh, the answer to this question is yes and there are some things that God can't do, then, of course, we're in a lot of trouble. Now, there are seven great questions in Genesis chapter number 18. You'll find a great one in verse 9, a great one in verse 12, a great one in verse 13, a great one in verse 14, a great one in verse 17, and a great one in verse 23. That one there says, Will God destroy the righteous with the wicked? That's a great question, brother. I mean, uh, that's some deep thinking. There's one there, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What a question that is. Many people today are accusing God of doing wrong. I run into people, maybe they had a little baby die or something like that. And they'll say, well, I just ain't going back to church. Well, I don't, I'm mad at God because He let my baby die. Or I'm mad at God because this happened. You know, that's a great question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Will God do right under every circumstance? I was driving down the mountain last night and sometime or another, I don't know when it was, on the way home or sometime, and I was thinking and I thought about all the multiplied millions of people in this world and that were most of them were going to hell. And I thought about, and, and logic and reasoning would say, well, if, if God knew all this was going to happen, why did He let it even get started to begin with? And brother, when you begin to question like that and your mind wants to reason God, you just remember what the Bible said. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? There's a lot of things mean you don't understand, brother. There's a lot of things we can't understand. Don't know why God does what He does. But there's one thing I can guarantee you this morning. God Almighty always does what's right. It may not seem right to you at the time, but God Almighty knows what He's doing. And He always does what is right. That's a great question in the Word of God. But let's focus our attention on this one question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The Lord appeared to Abraham three times. The first time in Genesis 12, 6, when He called him out and said, I'll give you a land that you don't know about. The second one was in Genesis 17, 1, when He told him He was the God who was enough. And then the third time in Genesis 18, to let him know that He was His friend. Abraham had been justified there. And brother, he's let Abraham know that He was His friend. And he believed God and he was called the friend of God and that he was going to have a, a son and fulfill his promise. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Let me ask you just to say a couple of things this morning. Number one, there is no promise too hard for God to fulfill. There is no promise too hard for God to fulfill. You may be living today in what seems like impossible circumstances. You may be loving to live with a husband that's just as flat, mean as the devil. You may be having to live with a wife that just mean as the devil. I mean, she may beat you. <laughs> they, a lot of them, they, they, they're going to set up a home for battered husbands now, nowadays. And brother, she may knock you around, slap you down, and everything else. You think, 
Lord, it's impossible. No, no, there, there's nothing too hard for God. Let me say to you here this morning, if you're carrying a heavy load, and I know that there are a lot of you that are carrying a heavy load, and I know that probably some of you literally waded through torment because you'd go to church and try to serve God, let me just encourage you, friend, there's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too hard for God. I like that song the choir sing, brother, there's nothing, no nothing, no nothing, no nothing that God can't do. I tell you, brother, he can make a door where there ain't no door. I mean, he can go apart the Red Sea. I mean, you say, well, there's no way this... Oh, yeah, you better not say that. With God, nothing shall be impossible. You know what our problem is? We, we let our imagination run as far as it can go, and we stop God right there. I like that verse that said, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. God is able to do way up past anything you can be masked. Oh, brother, I tell you, is anything too hard for the Lord? There are 30,000 promises in the Bible, somebody said. One for every phase of life. There is no problem you've got this morning to what God hasn't got a promise that He got to help you with. Somebody said that you're tarry. If you're having problems, tarry at the promise of God. For God always comes back by that way. If you want to find God, hang around His promise, brother. He always passes by there sooner or later. And the Lord will meet you and you'll begin to know His presence. I heard about this preacher one time and he just heard about. I don't know why it is, but every time you get ready to fly, about two days before it, you hear about a plane crashing. And uh, here before I went to Florida, when I flew to Florida a couple of weeks ago, I, I just heard down there at the Douglas Airport in Charlotte, two of them come and just a higher hitting each other. And every time I hear, every time I get ready to fly, it seems like one crashes or something like that. And this preacher, and a lot of preachers won't even fly on account of that. And a lot of people, I bet these people in here, you couldn't hog tie and get them on an airplane. I mean, they quote that verse that Jesus said, Lo, I am with you. Oh, wait. I tell you, brother, I said, How you get me up in one of them things? I tell you, brother, this one preacher, I know, uh, he, he wouldn't get on one. And this one preacher, he's having to fly somewhere in an airplane. And boy, he's scared half to death. And he just heard about one going down in the Pacific Ocean. And he's going over to Holy Land or somewhere over there. And brother, he began to get up there and he was scared looking down all that water beneath him. And brother, he just started searching the Word of God for a promise. And he said, I'm going to find me a promise. And he got on one on old Deuteronomy 33 and verse 27. And he said, The eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he said, hey, man, he just pictured God's big arms underneath that plane. And he said, boy, the Lord's got his arms under this thing. And he's got a promise there in the book. I'm leaning on the everlasting arm. It can't go down unless God lets it anyway. Hey, man, they couldn't crash one of them things on purpose if God decided he wanted to hold it up. There's no promise too hard for God to fulfill. I tell you, brother, in Numbers 23, 19, the Bible said, God is not a man that he should lie. Hath he not said and shall he not do it? Shall he spoken and shall he not make it good? You know what? People will lie to you. I, I, I'm amazed at how much faith people got in the weatherman and how little faith they got in God. Boy, the weatherman will come on there and he say it's going to snow and they go in to have a hissy, brother. I mean, just I mean, go down to the grocery store and they're in there fighting each other, getting the last jug of milk and eggs, and I mean, don't live a half a mile from the store and brother, go down there and fill up the the cabinets and get everything just right. Oh, they said it's coming a big one. Oh, we better get ready, honey. I mean, make sure we got oil in the oil tank. And boy, we just go all two pieces. And and have you noticed how many times they've missed it this year? Here a while back, they said it was going to come a big snow, and it was the prettiest day that we'd had. And, I mean, it was a nice weather, and then they'll say, well, no snow in sight, and it's liable to come a blizzard. And you know what? The Lord just takes all that big technology they've got, and this AccuWeather forecast, how they got it just right, and just turns it backwards to make fools out of them once in a while to show them He's still in control. You know what the weather forecast is? Just exactly what God wants it to be. I mean, son, over there in the Bible, he said, He saith to the snow, Be thou upon the earth. 
And God says, be thou on the earth, son, it's going to snow. And, and if God says rain, it's going to rain. But I tell you, it amazes me how people will believe the weatherman. And I know they're doing the best they can. And they get it right about 50% of the time. But they'll still believe them. And God never has told them nothing wrong. The other thing he says is right. And yet they doubt the promises of God. God said there's a judgment day coming. How come you ain't getting ready for that? I mean, how come you live in your life every day just like the Bible's a lie? Teenagers, God said you was going to be judged for your life. How come you live for the devil all week long? Mamas, daddies, God said you was going to give an account. How come you don't believe that? You know why? You don't believe God's promises. You know, years ago, I told this over to Revival the other night. Years ago, when I broke with my old friends, they went one way and I went the other way. I said, see you around, boys. They said, bro. They didn't say, bro. They said, daddy. They said, ain't you going to go with us no more? Nope. See you later, boys. This is where I go the other way. I come to the place where I believe the promises of God. Son, I believe there's going to be a judgment. I believe the reason I forsook the old world, I left them back yonder 12 years ago, brother. I ain't planning by the grace of God of going back neither. The reason I left that crowd is because I believe this promises of this book is true. And this book says the world passeth away. You ever seen them big fancy places they show on television where in Hollywood where they have the Grammys and the Emmys and all? There'll not be one light shining upon another, brother. But God ain't going to bust out one of these days. There'll not be one stone left on another stone that God ain't going to throw down. The courthouse in Marion's going to blow the kingdom come one of these days. All the fanciest building, the nicest house you ever seen in your life, it's just going to crumble. You say, how do you know that? God promised it. He said it. It's just as good as if it had already happened. There's no promise too hard for God to fulfill. You know, there's been many a time, you know, when I sign Bibles, when I go off somewhere to preach and, and people crowd around and say, would you sign my Bible? I always write down Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I guess one of my favorite life verses is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I've had to claim that verse many and many a time. You know what that verse says? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Every time I get myself in trouble, when I start trying to figure out a way out for myself, I start thinking, the Lord, uh, it should be this way, it should be that way. The Bible said, lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. You know how you can know you're in the will of God? Obey that verse. But trust the Lord with all thine heart, don't lean your own understanding. In everything you do, acknowledge Him. And the promise is, He shall direct thy path. You say, well, I just don't know if He's directing me or not. You ain't calling Him a liar, are you? If, if He said He'd do it, He'll do it. Amen. Now quit arguing with Him. Go out and serve Him. Amen. There's no promise too hard for God to fulfill. You know what? I'd hate to... I mean, we used to go out there at the swimming pool and go swimming all the time. Boy, I remember the first time I got up on that high dive out there, my soul. It don't look that high from down here. But when you get up on top of that thing, and then you ain't going to go down in front of them girls and everybody else. you got to go off after you get up there. And I don't know, I was just a little kid. I, I mean, I don't know how old I was, just young. First time I went up there, man, I said, oh, here it goes. And the first time I just kind of went like this, you know, and jumped off. And I finally got to where I'd hold my arms out. And then I finally got to where I'd dive off and all that stuff. And boy, I never will forget uh, how scary it is falling down through that. I feel like you leave your stomach up there on top. And boy, you just, it seems like everything just leaves you all of a sudden. And that's just jumping into water. You know what God wants us to do? Come out here on the end of the diving board and the pool is empty. And he says, dive off! And you say, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, just as soon as you put the water in there, I'm ready to go, Lord. And the Lord say, no, you dive off, then I'll put the water in. That's why many people don't do nothing for Jesus. They ain't willing to step out on faith. You say, well, you'd be crazy! Yeah, but you know when you'll go out like that? It's when you just get sick and tired of just standing there. You don't want to go down. There ain't nothing to go back to. And you say, all right, 
Lord, if I bust my brains out, if I perish, I perish. Here goes. And more, and more about the time you die, Lord, you're scared. And all of a sudden, there's the water. And you hit. That's the way you're supposed to walk on God's promises. Claim His promise. You say that verse you quoted was out of Deuteronomy, Brother Danny. Yeah, I know, but that's doctrinally. I'm talking practically. Practically, thank God, I can claim any bit of it, I can claim. Hallelujah, brother. I mean, if you can, you know, I kind of worry about these people that get so doctrinally minded that they can't even read the Psalms no more. I tell you, man, I, if I can get me something out of Leviticus and live by it, I'm going to get it, amen? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking doctrinally. I know doctrinally we'll teach that to you some other time. But I'm telling you, brother, God may have not have said everything in the Bible to me, but thank God He said it all for me. And brother, if you can claim it, claim it, and stand on it by the help of God. David Livingston and them great missionaries went and done their work for God by claiming promises God wrote to the Jews. Call unto me and I'll answer you and show you a great and mighty thing which thou knowest not. You say, well, I, hey man, if you can grab it, grab it. Stand on it. Thank God for it. Amen. When your loved ones are dying and you need help from God, you don't care who is wrote to you. You want to say, amen, God, I need help. Give it to me. You know something? I never will forget. I was talking about Mike last night and I preached over at the church. And uh, I never will forget Mike when he first came here and got saved. Mike sat right over yonder, about where Brother Allen's sitting, right over against the wall somewhere right in there. And that morning I gave the invitation. Sure enough, here he came. I don't know how many of you were here. That was in 1978. Boy, had old long hair and he's on drugs. He's on... And he'd been drunk and everything else. He stepped out of there and come running down through here. He fell down on the altar and got saved. That morning he told me when he came out, he said, Danny, I turned everything over to the Lord this morning. Yeah. You know, time has showed that Brother Mike meant what he said that morning. He's proved himself now. And you know something that day? Old Mike went through a changing period. Now, you young people listen to this. It's going to help you if you listen. Mike went through a, a transitional period there. Right after you first get saved, you drop all your old sinner friends. But you don't know no Christians hardly yet. And you just kind of all by yourself there for a little while. I mean, it's for a while there, you just don't know what to do with yourself. He quit smoking pot, and he quit drinking, he quit, but he didn't know about revivals and Bible study. No. He's just sitting at home twiddling his tongue, about to go nuts. And he came to church, and, and you know, the devil will tell you if, if you're a a young man in church or a young woman, he'll say, Boy, you ain't never going to get a girlfriend doing like this. All the pretty ones are mean as the devil. And if you don't drink with them, no, that you ain't never going to get a, a girlfriend or you ain't never going to get a boyfriend as long as you have to have one that's a Christian. So you better take whatever you can get. Mike went through that stage. If you look around, all the and the church wasn't probably a third as big then as it is now. And the pickings was pretty slim. And, but, I mean, he looked around and, I mean, I mean, the only one that was single, ugly as homemade sin. And, but, you begin to look around and you think, I wish there was a pretty Christian girl for me to date. You know what old Mike hung in there? And he said, I went and got him one morning and I was going to buy his stereo. And I told him, I said, brother, the Lord able to send you a Christian girlfriend. I said, God's able. He promised. God's good. If His promises are true, He's able to do it. And He's able to do it for anybody in here this morning. You say, well, I, I just ain't no, nobody for me to date and have a good time with and everything. Oh, yeah, they are. Just believe God. Don't trust in your own understanding so much. And old brother Mike, that morning, we bought his stereo to give him a play in the Christmas play. We was going to play some music. And so, he's on our way up here that morning. And I said, man, I really appreciate you letting us borrow this thing. We're going to play some music. He had a great big old Pioneer receiver and a Ikea turn, I mean, a cassette deck and turntable. Big old tweeter, woofer, boomer, boomer. Speak about that big man. Blow you out the room. I ain't kidding you. And I guess his mama probably had a shouting spell when he hauled that thing out of the house. I mean, he about busted her eardrums with that thing. And he, he said, Brother Danny, that morning, he said, I'm going to give this to the church. 
I said, now, brother, I, don't, I didn't mean that. I just want to buy it. We just want to use it for the Christmas play. He said, no, I want to give it to the church. He said, I quit listening to my rock music. And I laid them things up. He said, I don't have no need for it no more. Just collecting dust. I want church to have it. I, and, boy, I, I told it last night over there. And I said, Lord's going to bless you, boy. Lord's going to bless you. You wait and see. And it wasn't no time. So in one morning walked Sherry. And she's lost and on her way to hell. Her and another Sherry. And I preached that morning. They got in conviction. And one of them got saved that night at another church. And it wasn't one of that student after that. Till Sherry got saved. Well, business is picking up a little bit. Now, in case you're a visitor here this morning, if you marry any one of our girls, you can't take her out of here. Amen. Amen. You'll knock a knot on your head. So if you got you your eyes for any of them, just plan on staying here, big boy. Amen. We done lost too many of them that way. Ken and Teresa got married yesterday up here in Teresa Morgan and Ken. I go on the honeymoon some more today, I reckon. And I told Ken the other evening, I said, Now listen, Ken, Teresa's one of our girls. She's been here a long time. And I said, boy, if we start missing her, you know who we're going to hold responsible? Yeah. He said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, right, you! Yeah. And I tell you, boy, it wasn't long, so I looked around, and old Mark, he began to sit a little bit closer to where Sherry was sitting. Next thing you know, he sat beside her. And bless his heart, he had such a good Christian spirit that he was willing to go by and pick her up and give her a ride to church when she needed it. I mean, he was suffering for Jesus, brother. He was willing to bring her to church, bless her heart. By the way, let me say something. I may not get the rest of the message this morning. Let me say something to you girls. Girls, get your boyfriend at church. Get you on at church. You say, Ugh. just hold your horses. Well, ain't it to an end yet. Get you on at church. Don't get some old mop head out there in the well. I mean, he may look like Romeo now, but man, when you come in, your eyes is blue and black. And you can't trust him out of your sight, and he run around on you. He ain't secured then. Next thing I know, boy, they're sitting together, coming regular together, and sure enough, one day come over to the house. Brother Danny, we need to talk to you. And I told him he wasn't wanting to go to the mission field, neither. And wedding bells were ringing. And next thing you know, along came little Matthew. And then Brother Mike got the church up there and he's passing, and then along came Mark. We're still looking for Luke, John, <laughs> Acts, and Romans, First Corinthians, Second and Grace and Thieves and Philippians, Colossians, and First, Second Thessalonians, and Timothy, and Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. And well, I tell you, brother, uh, uh, God, you know what? I looked at them last night, and Sherry got up and sung a beautiful song. Man, I tell you, tears coming out of her face. And boy, I tell you, glory to God. I sat there that night last night. I seen her up singing. I seen Brother Mike passing the church. Got to live up in the beautiful mountains. Man, of hot springs, metaphor, Max Pat. Up yonder on top of the mountain, and two little fine boys reading his Bible. No more drugs, no more alcohol, I mean, no more running around. I can't happily marry. I'm telling you, yeah, there's no promise too hard for God to fulfill. I tell you, it made me want to shout when I seen what God had done right here in my church. I mean, no counseling than that. I mean, uh, no, no, no uh, family planning organization. Man, that thing out. It was just God Almighty working in people's lives. I believe His promises. He said, don't be in such a hurry. Hang around. The promises of God are nothing too hard for the Lord. One of the things I want to say this morning, let me say right quickly, there's no problem too hard for God to solve. Bible said, commit thy way unto him. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Economic problems. You say, I'm laid off, Brother Danny. I can't make end meet. I, I can't make, pay my bills. What am I going to do? I'm glad to tell you this morning, there's no problem. Do I have to God to solve? You say, what should I do? I can't get no work. I can't pay my bills. Well, the first thing you've got to do is get yourself totally right with God. Amen. See, you can't fool around with him and play games. Reason God bless Mike because Mike meant business. 
You can't just cheat, cheat around on God and live for Him half time and expect Him to work your problems out. You've got to get right with Him. If you ain't willing to get right with Him, you just keep your problems. Right. I mean, you've got to come clean. You say, well, it's hard. All right. Sweet yourself. But God will help you with your problems if you'll come clean with Him. Domestic problems. Drug problems. Alcohol. Family problems. Marriage problems. I never heard tell in my life many people have marriage problems. And I bet you the ones we hear about are just the tip of the iceberg. There's probably a thousand times more of it that never gets outside the walls of the home and people keep it quiet. Homes just on the verge of breaking up, splitting up. But yet outwardly they've got everybody thinking they're getting along fine and, and, everybody, and, and we're not even burning to pray for them because... Outwardly, everything looks all right, but when it's in those four walls, they're just fussing and knives being thrown at each other. Symbolic, spiritual knives. Uh, maybe real knives, I don't know. I mean, darts at each other, and they're just... There's nothing too hard for God. There's no problem too hard for God to solve. You know what the devil did you know, people? You'll have a fight or two, or three or four. Man, you'll have all kind of, all hell broke loose in your house. And your wife says, I'll send the man to you anyway. I know that I've got the will of God. And you know what the devil will do? He'll say, you messed up and married the wrong one. And you're going to pay for the rest of your life. And you're going to never be happy. Just then do it to the end to keep from sinning. That's what he'll you. He'll you tell you, there's no way your home can ever be happy. You might as well just tough it out. So you won't commit adultery and wind up in the divorce. Just stick it out. My friends, don't take that defeated attitude. Amen. Hit them knees Amen. for hours if you have to. Call God. There's no problem too hard for God to solve. Some of them people had a problem at the Red Sea, didn't they? Humanly speaking, there was no way in the world. If they had went to a counselor, the counselor said, I tell you, the best thing y'all do is turn around and go surrender to Pharaoh and hope he don't kill you. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's what they have told. Human reason. You know what a lot of people tell you? I think the best thing you could do would be to leave your husband or get an abortion. Or have... Listen, man, they're leaving God out of it. Yeah, There's no problem. Who has the God to solve? We don't, you don't come in here this morning and hear me tell you, just go ahead and give in. you got to get drunk a little bit. I mean, you got to, I mean, man, who would want to come here and preach like that? I'm telling you this morning, friend, there ain't nothing God can't help you over. I mean, if God ain't able to solve our problems, He wouldn't be God anyway. And the waste no time in here. Praise God, He's able to solve your problem this morning. Let me say, lastly this morning, there's no person too hard for God to save. That's right, that's right. No! No! I've known some hardens. I pray the Lord never ceases to amaze me. He'll take the very one you think and never get saved and save them. And I tell you, brother, there ain't nobody too hard for God. Now, if we, if we would be honest, everyone, I'm talking about me, if every one of us would be honest, a lot of times we'll witness somebody, or our neighbor, something like that, and inside we'll think, no hope for them. I mean, uh, and we, even, we may not say it, but we think it. And, and sometimes the Lord will lay them on our heart again, and we just kind of say, well, I think the Lord laying them on my heart. Uh, them on my heart. Uh, uh, they, I, don't, I just don't believe they'll ever get saved. No, that ain't right. No, no person too hard. You say, Brother Danny, I, I just don't believe my husband could ever get saved. You don't know my husband. Hey, you know this God I'm talking about? I've said it to our ladies many, many times. God's got a hammer that can crack any nut in this world. And I believe that. He's got a monkey wrench that'll fit any nut, brother. That's right. He can unscrew the unscrewable. <laughs> really? I mean, I mean, he can save the unlovely. Change the hard-hearted. I mean, they may come in and slap you down and say, I don't know your religion. Take your Bible, your Jesus. Oh, I don't mean nothing. You don't know what's going on in that heart. 
A lot of times when they act real tough and mean like that, when they lay down at night, boy, the Holy Ghost. See, the, they can't get the Holy Ghost out. They may throw the Bible around there. It ain't going to God that easy, brother. I mean, the Holy Ghost can walk right past the prison guards through the wall and through the bars, brother, and go right down, bam, hit them in the heart. I thank God there's no person too hard for God to save. Remember me and Doug Malone was up there in Michigan one time. I'll tell you a couple things, and I'm going to close this morning. And he was getting ready to eat at somebody's house. And they had the meal all fixed up and everything. Boy, I was hungry, too. And, and about that time, the telephone rang. said, is the preacher there? They said, yeah, here he is. He got on the phone. And uh, he said, yeah, it'll be right over. He said, there's a bunch of young people and teenagers having a pizza party. Oh, it's on one of them's trailer, and they wanted us to come witness to them. He said, "Come on, brother Danny, come on." We got we got in the in the car, went over, went and just left dinner, sitting there on the table. I tried to be as spiritual as I could be. I, said, I don't care. I steam witnessing more than my necessary food. But my 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 insides were saying something else. The boy, we went over there and. and Talked that bunch of teenagers, and there's a wild bunch, and there's one of them out shining his car, you know, and had the doors open, acting real cool. And, you know, we always want to put the doors open on the car and lay the mats out there for two or three hours and shine on it and look real bad, getting it ready to go ride around Hardy's about 40,000 times that night. And he's out there fixing things around, and uh, I'll be honest with you, we talked to them, and it's just like, it's just like talking to that wall right there. I mean, it didn't see any responses. Well, yeah, yeah, well, okay. And we left. And I thought, boy, what a waste. And didn't do a bit of good. You know what the Lord made me do? He made me eat them words. So the next time I went up there for revival, one of them boys was in church with a big smile on his face and a Bible. I mean, I, you couldn't even tell it even, even done anything to him. Really, we limit the Lord a lot, you know, because we think, now, boy, I, uh, he's weak. I can talk him into getting saved. And we try to do it on our own strength and our own ability. And, brother, you're dealing with Almighty God. Almighty God. I don't care if we're a college professor. I don't care if we're a scientist. I don't care if we're a principal of a school. God Almighty's got a hammer can crack them. Not my word is a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. One of them, I don't know, some more of them might have got saved. That old boy got saved and loved the Lord. And as far as I know, still in church doing good. And that's been five, four, five years ago. Yesterday, we had a revival over in Stumptown yesterday evening. No bill over here got right with the Lord. Man, I tell you, Earlene called me. I, you don't care for me using that, selling that, brother. I, mean, I don't want to embarrass you, none. I just felt like the Lord wanted me to tell it. Earlene called and said, Brother Danny, can you come over here? Somebody want to talk to you. And I is 10 to 1. I was supposed to have been here at, at 1.30. And I had to take a shower and get ready. And I said, well, i got to be at that wedding. I'll, 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 and I said, I'll be there by 15 after 1. And just spend a few minutes with him. And then I'll come on. He said, he wants to talk to you. So I went over there and he and Tater was waiting on me out there at the driveway. Bill got in. I don't even know Bill's last name. Just met him yesterday, but I... Talked to him there a little bit. And uh, he got in the car and sat down. And son, he didn't beat around the bush. He just got in, started crying, and said, Preacher, i got to get to God. I said, Well, glory. He said, i got to get to God. That's what he said. The guy showed him scripture there and everything. I, I was trying to say, Are you sure now? I've got time to talk you out of it. You know, when somebody's that willing, that he said, I've got to get to God. He said, I've come to the end of my rope. Amen. He said, I've tried everything. And he went into the little background of his life and how he'd had sin and, and God had, uh, had dealt with him. And he said, I've had it. I've had it. I'm at the end of my... And by the way, that's when God will hit you. It's when you get to the end of your road. As long as you're still enjoying your sins. Don't you still say, I'm going to hold on to this and that? God ain't going to help you. Brother, you've got to get to the place where you say, I've had it, had it. I'm ready for a change. I'm ready for a new life. And God will give it to you.
Boy, we prayed there Sunday. We, I about want to shout, brother. I mean, uh, we, we was praying, and people coming by, and, 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 he, and I said, did he do it, Bill? And Bill said, yeah. I, he said, I got right with the Lord. And he said, I'll see you in the morning. I forgot about what time it was. He was up here getting ready to have the wedding. And boy, I tell you, he, he got out and hugged Peter's neck. They was out there, and I went, I've seen them in the rear view mirror, man. I tell you, Lord of God, I tell you, brother, that's what, stand up over there, Bill, let them see who you are. Has that fella right there? Ah! Lord of God, that's what Jesus can do. I'm going to tell you, there's no person too hard for God to say. And he can do it, he can do it, he can do it if you'll trust him. I tell you, brother, I come running, I was about late. Oh, what a blessed sight. I, I, I couldn't help but, man, it, I'm on the, I looked back in the mirror and I thought how Tater used to be. And I, and I seen them out there hugging each other, brother, and stop town and tear each other's neck. Bless the Lord. Ain't nobody too hard for God to save. You'd have knew Tater before he got saved. Amen. If you knew some of these boys up here, why we could stand up here this morning and have testimony after testimony after testimony of how that they couldn't change, they couldn't change, but they came to Jesus and he saved them, brother. There's no person too hard for God to save. I'm glad to tell you he's able to do it. What you say, brother? I'm glad he's able. Amen. I tell you, he's able. You say, what they so happy about? You ought to see that guy first time he come in here. His beard was down to here. His hair was down to, He looked like a troll, man. Under a bridge. God saved him. Delivered him from drugs. Delivered him. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. There's nothing too hard for me. You may be saying, preacher... I'm glad it worked for that, for Bill. I'm glad it worked for Tater. I'm glad it worked for Steve and Paige and these boys. Preacher, can he really do it for me? Oh, so you may be out there this morning saying, Kenny, could, if God really could do that for me, I'd grab it in a second. Friend, he can do it. He can do it if you'll let him. It's up to you. Somehow or another, the devil will tell you you're different. And they're just on a religious trip. And it can't really happen to you. It can happen to you. Yes, Let's stand together our heads bowed and eyes closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Friend, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. There may be someone here. I don't know why the Lord had me to preach this message this morning. I had planned something else. Seemed like God just directed my heart this way. There's probably somebody here this morning... But your life is absolutely in a mess. I don't know. A lot of people in here this morning I've never even seen before in all my life, I don't guess. I don't know why you're here. I can tell you one thing. God can help you this morning if you'll let him. God can help you this morning if you'll let him. He ain't dead. He ain't dead. I tell you, our God's not going on vacation. He ain't died and quit dealing with men. He's still on the phone this morning. He can help you if you'll let him. Christians are praying. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. There's probably many, many, many people in here this morning needing help from God. Why don't you let the Lord help you this morning? Why don't you let him help you? Will you do it? Will you do it? Our Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Dear God, that you'd help that soul this morning that's still wondering, still doubting. And they're really wondering, can it happen to them? Oh, God, help them know that it can. Oh, hallelujah. Praise your name. Praise your name for what you've done for Bill. Praise your name for what you've done for Tater. Praise your name for what you've done for me one day. Down at Nebo Baptist Church. Glory to God. Lord, I pray this morning the Spirit of the Lord would move. Oh, Lord, move this morning. Move. Honor us with the presence of God right now. We ask, help that man, that woman, that boy, that girl who's holding back. God, help them to just break out of that and come to Jesus this morning and bring all the problems and all the burdens and all the sins. Draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In his name we pray. Amen.